Blockchain technology has the potential to revolutionize every single aspect of our online activity, from money to art to games. And in this video, I want to talk about a particular use case that blockchain can impact and some recent developments that have sparked the conversation for innovation in this particular area. I'm going to talk about this as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's talk about some recent events that have taken place that show why we need blockchain technology in the first place. There's lots of different ways you can use blockchain technology from money to NFTs, to games, et cetera, et cetera. But let me show you one additional use case and why it's important. So I'm gonna go through a couple different uh, you know, news articles here and actually kind of connect the dots so you can see this. So I want to start off with, you know, the news that came out lately that uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, has now stepped down uh, and has been replaced by the former CTO. All right. So there's new leadership at Twitter, which, you know, stands to reason that we could see some new decisions uh, made by Twitter itself on how the product takes form in the future. OK. And immediately upon his departure, you know, we already see uh, an update from Twitter itself talking about how they're going to expand their privacy policy. So beginning today will not allow the sharing of private media such as images or videos or private individuals without their consent. Publishing people's private info is also prohibited under the policy as is threatening or incentivizing others to do so. And then we have another take here that says, you know, in light of both of these things, you know, Jack's departure and then also this new policy change that Twitter is about to get way worse. So, you know, why is that? Let's let's connect the dots about why this could be a bad thing and how this presents a problem that blockchain could potentially have an answer to. Well, going back to the content policy, you know, on the surface, this could sound good, right? Like you, you, you definitely want people's private information to be protected. But the real problem with this is that it opens the door for abuse to where you could, you know, make any behavior that you don't like potentially fit under a policy violation and ultimately censor it. And that's really the problem here is censorship. So spoiler alert, you know, blockchain really helps with censorship resistance we'll talk about that here more in a minute but censorship is the is the key thing that you want to look out for here so you know this article about twitter getting way worse this has nothing to do with blockchain this is just connecting the dots you know to see what problems it could potentially you know create with something like twitter and they're saying you know it's been 24 hours since jack's vaccination and twitter's already updated its content policy in a manner that effectively makes citizen journalism impossible so that's one thing that they're talking about is like hey if you now have a content you know policy that says you can't post information about private individuals that makes citizen journalism can't be something that can even happen online anymore which effectively could be censorship so if you have a centralized platform that you know people post their own videos on of uh, events they witness in real time you know they could that leaves that leaves so much power in their hands to just censor things they don't like and let things um you know that let things just be as they are that they do like or even promote things that they like and completely censor things they don't like and so this is the inherent problem with centralized web 2.0 companies particularly with social networks. And it's this author's view that this problem can get a lot worse with Jack's departure and that Twitter could get way worse. And it stands to reason that lots of other social networks could be headed in the same direction. So how can blockchain potentially uh, provide an alternative to this and make this problem better? Well, at, you know, as, as we see the horrors of what can happen with Web 2.0 centralized companies, particularly social networks, the problem comes from centralization and all the sub problems that stem from that. So one of the big sub problems from centralization is censorship. OK, some some centralized authority can just say we like this. We're going to promote it. We don't like this. We're going to suppress it or eliminate it entirely. And with Web 3.0, you have censorship resistance because that's one of the inherent properties of blockchain is immutability, not letting things change once they're on the blockchain itself. So you could create blockchain social network that take advantage of this. We've already seen many uh, blockchain social networks that have been experimented in the past. N very few of them have achieved much traction because they a lot of times they just, you know, grafted on token incentives that haven't really worked very well. But we're starting to get to a point with technology and some promising experiments in the future where we could see actually pretty compelling efforts for crypto and Web 3.0 based social networks. So let's take a look at how this could be implemented so that you can see where this technology might head in the future. You know, some of this stuff's going to be tried. We're going to see what works. But let's actually look at a couple of concrete benefits. So let's zero in on this problem of censorship resistance and how, you know, censorship might be implemented in a social network that you use today. So let's say you're on Twitter, all right, and you go and you browse your news feed here. Let's just say I just go open up a new tab, open up my news feed. So right here I have a timeline and my timeline is not necessarily showing me the most 
uh, recent updated things, all right? That's how social networks used to work is like you see the most recent posts first, but now, you know, social networks uh, give you relevant content. Things that get the most engagement tend to appear at the top of your timelines if you check it infrequently in particular because they want your attention. They want you staying on the social network so you'll look at ads, basically. So this does have some benefits to the end user because it keeps the social media interesting, right? Like if you want the value of being, you know, entertained by social media or learning, whatever it is, there is a value benefit and you actually seeing the most relevant stuff first. But the, just like everything else that has a good side also has a bad side. So this is how censorship can creep in without you knowing it. So what happens if basically someone who controls the algorithm inside the social network to suppress things they don't like or just promote things they do like or somewhere in between, all right? Then you really have no way of knowing how the algorithm works. It's a complete black box that there's no transparency for. And you never know if your post could potentially get shadow banned on a platform or whatever, all right? And so similarly, like if you look at the trends over here on the sidebar, uh, you know, <laughs> who knows like if these trends are even accurate sure they might tailor the trends to topics that you're interested in like i see matic trending here i highly doubt this is trending for everybody who uses twitter twitter probably learns like what i'm potentially interested in but this is another place where you know trends could potentially be manipulated right twitter could just surface things they like or suppress things they don't like and there's also gonna be people out there that say hey all this stuff is just a myth like these centralized services don't really manipulate anything and so Let's inter even entertain the possibility that that position is true. Let's talk about how blockchain, at the very least, could put that myth to bed completely and also fix the problem of censorship if it actually does exist in these you know, Web 2.0 platforms. So how can crypto essentially fix this problem and create a blockchain-based social network? Okay, so... We talk about blockchain basically being immutable. That's how you get censorship resistance. Essentially, it's to create a decentralized protocol where all the content for the social media itself goes on chain. Okay. And now if you're technical at all and you're saying, hey, that's not scalable, that's never going to work. I'm going to explain that in a more nuanced way here in a minute. But just for simplicity's sake, let's just say all the social media goes onto the blockchain itself. And it's governed by this, you know, decentralized protocol that maybe is governed by a DAO that has token holders or maybe just the users of the social media app itself itself. And so this protocol is where all the posts are stored that, you know, go into the social network and also onto the blockchain. And then maybe you have a more web 2.0 application that actually has servers and things like that, that maybe, you know, does the algorithm part of things, because that's probably not going to work on the blockchain itself. And then this algorithm could be open sourced and put on GitHub to where, you know, people can actually audit it, All right, So the algorithm might be able to change over time, it might not be immutable, but the whole point is all the content for the social network lives on the blockchain itself. And then the algorithms, you know, or whatever, get posted online. And people with advanced technical skills, sure, not everyday users, but people with advanced technical skills could actually, you know, uh, take those algorithms, third party independent verifiers and make sure that, you know, on a per user basis that whatever data is here, if I, you know, set this up and run it, that it's going to generate uh, exactly what this end user sees. And it basically decentralizes the entire process for whistleblowers to come in and say, hey, this is not working like you advertise it to. And so another thing that you could do here is actually, you know, have a decentralized protocol that governs the social media, but then you might have an actual like centralized company that creates the algorithm and, you know, creates the website or the app that you experience the social media on. And let me, uh, let me explain how this could actually be a good thing because it decouples these things, all right? And there could be, you know, profit potential for the, the web 2.0 kind of version of the social network to create their own version of the app that talks to the same protocol, because then you could have multiple social networks that all use this same protocol. And it becomes more decentralized in this way. And that's a way where you could actually implement censorship in the app level, but not at the protocol level, because most people can understand that some form of censorship is makes sense, right? But we want to be transparent about what's actually getting censored. For example, Many people don't want to see adult content in their feed, particularly if there's kids around. So you could implement that type of censorship at the app level itself. If there's ever a problem where we found out that you know, the censorship was actually manipulated in some way, you could have a competitor that could actually implement it in a more straightforward manner without the censorship. And so it keeps that power in check by decentralizing this in every way, keeping their protocol over here, you have one maybe private company that implements the application and maybe you have another one so they all can sort of keep one another in competition to keep each other honest. And so that's how you could essentially design this from a very high level. Now the devil's in the details, all right? There's lots of technical challenges to overcome in order to make this work. I'm not saying this is just gonna happen tomorrow, okay? But if we're like charting out this you know, future of Web 3.0 that unfolds over the next two, five, 10 years even, then these are problems that could be solved on those timeframes. And so let's talk about what some of those 
you know, problems are from a technical limitation standpoint. So basically, a lot of it's got to do with scaling. And so let's start with off of media. So for example, like pictures, video, all this type of stuff, you don't want to put that on a blockchain in and of itself. Okay. So a pretty easy answer to this is you could take all the media that you you would post on a social network and put it on a decentralized file uh, storage network or distributed file storage system like IPFS, for example. Okay, it's an inter interplanetary file system. Works kind of like a blockchain, but not really. And whenever you store files on uh, IPFS, they're immutable. They can't change. And then you get back this hash, okay? And you take that hash and you store that on the blockchain. And that gives you a reference to where all the media uh, for, you know, social networks or even the post content themselves. That's how most NFTs work. Most NFTs are governed by a smart contract in the blockchain and the pictures that you see for NFTs, they live on IPFS most of the time. And so let's talk about other issues of like scalability in terms of cost, okay? Because even if you were able to just put IPFS hashes uh, and put regular posts on the blockchain, that's still going to be cost prohibitive. Like if you're just going to do that, like on layer one Ethereum, like nobody's going to pay, you know, $50 to create a social media post uh, or something like that, which will like a post or tip post, whatever. That makes total sense. Um, of course, that's never going to happen. But layer two scaling solutions could provide a, provide a pretty compelling alternative to this. So how layer twos work now is essentially you batch up transactions and you, uh, you know, include those onto the main blockchain in and of itself. And that makes each transaction much cheaper to do. So you can do this on an additional level, all right, where an application actually batches up social media posts and includes them onto a, a roll-up transaction, and then that gets batched up with other transactions and puts it back on the blockchain. And this could potentially reduce the cost of each individual post by a thousand X. And so there could be ways where these posts are either, you know, negligible in cost to the end user to where there's some economic incentive where they can actually make that money back or even more, or to where it's just free for the end user and, you know, that cost is subsidized you know, buy the protocol in some way. We don't have a clear answer to that right now, but in terms of cost, there are ways we can reduce it, you know, way significantly. And so that's, you know, some thoughts on the technical limitations and how we could eventually get there on these longer time frames. But let's talk about other benefits of crypto social networks besides just censorship resistance. I mean, there's, there's things like your social graph could go from one application to the other. So one of the big problems right now is like, let's say you have a bunch of friends on Facebook. Well, those aren't necessarily your friends on Instagram. They're not necessarily your friends on Twitter. So you could have your social graph actually, you know, translate if everybody has like a blockchain address, because that's how blockchains work. You're not users of the applications in and of themselves. You're users of the entire network and your, your identity transfers with you from one place to another. There's potentially all these different ways to uh, have composability with social networks, how you can plug one application into the other with these different protocols. The last two features what I'm talking about are very similar to like what Aave has actually been working on with their social media project. And there's, you know, lots of experiments on, you know, um, economic incentives that you could create with social networks. Again, we've had a lot of experiments with this in the past, like, you know, tipping posts, getting paid to post. A lot of these things haven't worked, but we could see some things that actually take off uh, in the future where maybe we have very web 3.0 style business models where people can actually earn uh, or own a part of the social network in some way where they have economic incentives and are rewarded as more people participate in the social networks. Maybe they're getting paid with the ads. There's lots of experiments. We'll just have to kind of see what sticks. All right. So that's an overview, uh, you know, some recent events about what's happening at Twitter. Talking people talking about you know change in leadership, uh, potential problems with censorship with these new policies, and how this could get worse, and how blockchain uh, potentially can make this problem better and present a compelling alternative that can show you why we need blockchain in the first place with crypto social networks that are censorship resistant. So, hope you like this video. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fast at the technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. They're like you need me courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can say become a blockchain master step-by-step -step, start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.